grandmother, Elvira, I knew. My grandmother, Lily Stone, died in my month, October, I don't know, uh, I never know. And Elvira Hardy, and then maiden name was Williams. She had a sister named Mary Jane. And uh, Mary Jane married Theodore Spear. Uh, Mary, no, he didn't marry. That's her, that's her son. Theodore Spear was Mary Jane Spear's son. And he married Bessie Stone. And uh, Tempe Hardy married Robert Stone. And uh, so her children. Theodore, who was her cousin, children, became first and second cousins. So. Now explain that again. Two, Two sisters, sisters. Mary Jane and Elvira married uh, I can't tell you who she married now. I'm, I'm getting mixed up because Theodore and Tempe were first cousins. They were Mary Jane and Elle Lauer's children. And uh, Elle Lauer's daughter, Tempe, married Bessie Lily Stone's son, Got it. Robert. And their children and the spear children became first and second, second cousins. cousins. So tell me about Elvira. Elvira was a little short lady. She looked like an Indian. They were Indian. I don't remember the tribe. She uh, never really talked that much about it. She just cried when she tried to tell us about seeing her mother on the auction block being sold in the slavery. Uh, our cousin Tony supposed to know the tribe that we come from, but I don't, I haven't been able to get him lately. I've been calling to ask him. She never really told us that I can remember what tribe they came from. What state was she from? I don't know. She was in Alabama all the time that I know of. She came to live with us. And Tempe was born in Alabama? Tempe was born in Coosa County, Alabama. Coosa County? Coosa County. Alabama. Yeah. But she used to say, my mother used to say she was born in Plum Island, Plum out of town in Mele out of the country. <laughs> she was quite a wit, quite a wit. So, she had ten brothers and sisters? And my father had the same, ten brothers and sisters. And he was born in... Chattanooga, Tennessee, I think. I had to get that ledger and look, because he wrote, he used to write it. How did they meet? Do you know? Tempe and, and uh, Robert. She, Tempe and Theodore, who were first and second cousins, first cousins, went to some kind of dance or something. And he met, he introduced Mama to Robert Stein. Tempe Hart. I guess my father had been married before. He never talked that much about it, but Mama would tell us he had had two other wives, but no children. That's why well she never. And I don't know how the courtship went because, do you want me to put this on tape? Sure. I used to ask her all the time how the beautiful, tall, good looking black woman like her Mary such a short fat man. I said, he must have had some hot stuff. She said, get out of here before I mash your mouth. <laughs> but 
I just went to Manchester because my father was about five, five. My mother was six, five, eleven. She measured. And uh, head and shoulders taller than my father. Right. And I just couldn't imagine that. I said, You must have had some hot stuff to do. get out of here. how they met except that Theodore and Tempe, who were cousins, went to some kind of dance or convention, not a convention, some, I think it was some kind of dance, and he introduced Tempe to Bob. So, what year did they move to Cleveland? where he could be his own boss. He did not like white people, but he was uh, determined to be an entrepreneur. And he did come to Toronto. He came to Cleveland first because he had two sisters, Maude and Bessie, lived in Cleveland. When he dated Maude, who was the one that had a hotel or a rooming house, he found that she was making bathtub gin and he did what and people would come and she would serve her at the back door and whatever and give him some bottles of liquor and he did not want his wife and daughter in that atmosphere. So he started looking for some place to go. He didn't want to stay in Cleveland because Cleveland was quite a racket town for black people. Somebody told him about a little town, a mill town called Toronto, Ohio. And it wasn't that far away from Cleveland. So he'd be able to come and visit his sister because he was very much a family man. And so he went there, found the mill, asked about having a job there and got one. He was a supervisor, but he still had to do some of the work. And it was just too much for him. It was too hot. He couldn't stand it. So he said that he was going to get some kind of business for himself. A man who was a superintendent of the mill was named Whitey Evans. They called him Whitey because he had some white blonde hair. And he told my father about uh, the mill dumped the uh, ashes and stuff out. And it was pieces of iron that didn't cook down or whatever. And that he could, if he could get somebody to help him, he could get that iron out of the scraps and then sell it back into the mill. They would buy it back from him. So he bought a truck, and he did not want to do it himself. He needed somebody to help him. So he hired a white man who could not get a job because he had a speech impediment. There was something wrong with his throat. And so uh, I used to know his name, but I forgot now. But anyhow, he was so thankful to my father for hiring him because of his speech impediment. Nobody would hire him because they couldn't understand. We knew him. And if you would look in his mouth and listen, you could understand what he was saying. But it was kind of oh, 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 like that. And people just didn't have time. They didn't want to be bothered. And he was so grateful to my father. Anything Daddy wanted him to do, he would do. He drove one of the trucks. Daddy worked one of the trucks. Then my father noticed that the ice man came to the black neighborhood after he had probably serviced the white neighborhood and a 25 pound piece of ice which had melted down to maybe about 15 was still sold to the black people 
as 25 pounds. So my father said, I can do better than that. If I went to the ice house, I'd come straight to the black neighborhood. So he bought a truck, came to the neighborhood, and sold the ice to them. And it had just melted a little bit. So he became ice man. Everybody had coal stoves. And the coal man would come and dump the coal at the edge of the yard where the black people lived and they had to go scramble and get. People got there first, got the biggest pieces. The last people got there got the dust and the little granular pieces. So my father said, I could do better than that. I could get another truck. I think he paid like five or ten dollars for the trucks. They were used trucks, never moved. And uh, he would uh, go to the coal mine, get a uh, load of coal. And I don't know if you realize how big a dump truck is, but coal is long on coal. First, he would dump it right at the entryway to the black neighborhood. But the people started squabbling. Because those who got there first with their buckets and bags and whatever would get the best pieces, and all the others would have to get this little random The leftovers. You know. It still burned, but they were, they had to have a shovel and all that stuff to get it up, some kind of bag or box to put it in so that it wouldn't fall through on the ground. So my father could not do the ice and the coal with the same truck. He had to buy another truck. Then he noticed that the white people's garbage was being picked up by a garbage truck in the white neighborhood. The black people were throwing their garbage out in the yard, turning it under the soil and having colored greens and tomatoes and whatever, tall as he was which was all right, but it was unsanitary, and he knew it. So he bought another truck for... Uh, for garbage? For garbage. And at that point, he decided to name, because he went to white people's houses very regularly, and the stores, the grocery stores told him, asked him if he would come and pick up their garbage. Much of it was... Well, vegetables, and many of them not rotten, because you know, it's one apple, the same one apple spoils whatever. Bunch. If they touch the other laying there, they rot each other, you know. So the grocery people would give him the whole boxes, one or two rotten apples and oranges or grapefruit. We have had, as children, every kind of fruit imaginable. Some of them we didn't even know what we were eating, but orange apples and lemons we were very sure of. So my father would bring these things home. My mother and her children would cut the rotten spots off of the apples, peel them, slice them up. My mother dried them hmm. in the sun in the summertime, half of a screen door with the piece of cloth laid on it out in the sun where the birds didn't fly over and do anything on it. We would dry those apples and she would make she would put them in washed flower sacks and hang them out of the sun mm. in a, a room. We just call it the back room. It was a storeroom with these dried apples in it. And when the winter came, we ate like crazy. I've been overweight all of my life. And my brother George, too. Marianne was very skinny. She ate, but she just, Mom said it made her poor to carry what she ate, because she ate plenty. But she was very skinny. She never weighed more than 106. And so she got married and got pregnant with now. I think she went up to like 120 or something. Tremendous, you know. And uh, we would peel, we were near an apple orchard. And this man, Mr. Sloan, S L O A M, who owned the apple orchard, said that we could get apples there. There were some certain 
sections where he got apples and took them to the stores. We were not allowed to go in that part. And the rest of the apple orchard, the apples would just fall on the ground and rot. He said we could have them. So my father had three trucks. He would take, well, we learned to drive very young. My brothers learned to drive trucks at nine years old. And I was about 14 when I learned because I was a shorty and a little bit afraid. And I had to, mama made a wooden box, covered it over with cloth and a little cotton padding so that I could sit up and look over the steering wheel because you got to sit up in that truck and mm -hmm. the gear shift is in the floor. Right. And we were determined to, Daddy wanted all of us to learn to, ride, to drive. He said, I can't drive these three trucks by myself. Somebody will drive them. And we asked Mama, why didn't she learn to drive? She said, I don't need to drive. I got five children and a husband to drive with it. I said, you go, girl. So that's what we did. And my father bought his first car, which was an Oldsmobile. He knew the man who had the car dealership. and. Uh, I'm sure the man gave him a good price, and my father was one of the, I mean, he, the car owner was one of the places he went to pick up stuff, so you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours kind of thing, and they gave him a very good price. Well, we all had learned how to drive the trucks, so we went from the trucks to the car. We all learned how to drive. My brothers were nine. The police were always at our house warning my father about letting these children drive. And my father would say, okay, I won't do it. And the police would say, if you do, we'll catch them again. We're going to have to arrest you. Okay. And as soon as the police go out of the yard and out of sight, my father would turn to my brothers and say, George, Robert, put those trucks in the garage. Ted took very good care of them. We did not have a garage at our house. But Where did they go? As far as from here, I'll say to Highlands, was a man who had a garage that would hold two trucks. He did not own a car, so he rented it to my father, and that's where they took the trucks. And so, that was it. Their name was Mr. and Mrs. Irvin. And that was in Toronto? That was in Toronto. And by the way, the section of Toronto where the black people lived was called Jetta. My sister Mildred and I came to the conclusion that uh, they were probably referring to the black neighborhood as the ghetto. And they didn't know how to spell it, so it ended up being Jetta. You know, they probably had the name G-H-E-T-T-O, is ghetto. But when, you, when a person who doesn't know how to read sees that G and he knows the G sound, he'll say J, Jetto. So it became Jetto. And every child, male child, who lived in Toronto when they were small, young, 13, 14 years old, learned to drive our trucks.